Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends, it is a trite trope on occasions like this to remark that the speaker needs no introduction. Uh, obviously, in many senses, that's clearly true. And there will be no long introduction. But with a hall packed as full as this is tonight, and when we know that there are people here who are well familiar with the scholarly career and many exploits of Professor Hans Gustav Güterbock in his broad-ranging studies of the ancient cultures he has been occupied with, it is not entirely certain that all those are equally familiar with his distinguished position in the course of Hittite and Anatolian philology and linguistics. There are linguists present tonight, and the Department of Linguistics is very proud in this university to claim Hans Gustav Güterbock among their number two, who are easily familiar with his fame in the domain of Hittite philology but who may not realize the enormous magnitude of his accomplishment in the totality of our studies in this century of Hittite and Anatolian culture. It is, as a matter of fact, just now, a touch over a full half century since about two years ago, Professor Gutebock first began his fieldwork in Anatolia, in Boascoe, as an active philologist in the field, reading texts, prime texts from the ground, and analyzing them on the spot. The sort of work that cannot be paralleled by anyone else now alive of similar stature. Indeed, Professor Güterbach can be numbered amongst the three or so living Hittite scholars of achievement in his field. None of those uh, remotely touch him in the breadth of their accomplishment on Hittite culture. His own accomplishments are not just philological and linguistic, not just historical. They touch on much more fundamental questions of literature which go outside the strict Anatolian Hittite field and go further into the reaches of Hittite art, all of which themes he has published on uh, notably. But specific to this evening, is his more particular accomplishment in the linguistics and philology of Anatolian matters that lie outside the mainstream of the principal Hittite texts. He is, incidentally, at home, not merely in the millennium 
or two he will be smooth. That group, which is now known as Luvian, his publications on hieroglyphic Luvian, which are part of Anatolian, only about a quarter of a century ago, once again was an, uh, a recognition in which Professor Guterbach's own observations uh, counted mightily in the very first opening of that finding, namely that hieroglyphic Luvian belonged not with Hittite proper, but with the other big branch that we know of in Indo-European Anatolian languages. He has participated in all of these phases over all of those five decades uh, at every stage that things have moved on. And so it should not surprise us at all that tonight we will be hearing from not only this magnificent scholar, but this best and truest of friends and neighbors that we have here in our own midst, that he will be taking up a topic which occupies him actively in these very recent years in uh, very sizable, uh, fresh vistas, and that reflect the accomplishment uh, of uh, a marvelous half century and then some. And so let us look forward now to this evening and, of course, to many more reports from Professor Guterbach that we expect to hear. Thank you very much, Eric Hemp. I wish that half of the accomplishments that you ascribe to me were really mine and were really true. I feel by no means up to what you just said. And as far as the linguistic in the proper sense is meant, I always let you do it. Uh, tonight, I must say, it's really the journalist's fault that I'm standing here. My mother, play, uh, when en anything uh, not so pleasant happened in our contemporary history, she always said it's all the fault of the, uh, of the journalists who blow up everything. We had a very nice, peaceful, and uh, joyful symposium arranged by my friend Martel Melling at Bryn Mawr College about the Trojan War. And what would happen? One of those journalists heard about it and had to write it up. And then all my friends came, but Hans, you have to tell us everything about it. Now, everything about it sounds like very much and is very much. And I will warn you right away, I am trying to make it everything. <laughs> Which means, and this is why I called it uh, Hittites and Greeks an overview. I'm not just talking about the Trojan War, but those who came particularly to hear about it, if you are patient, you will hear about it. <laughs> but I am starting with whatever we know about Greeks and Hittites and their possible relation or non-relation. This is really a problem which has been tossed around for 60 years by now. It was in 1924, only 
seven years after the Hittite language had been deciphered, that an, at that time, young Hittitologist, who, by the way, is still living at the age of 90 now, but no longer active in the last so many years, by the name of Emil Forer, who at that time worked in Berlin and had primary access to the then newly discovered Hittite original clay tablets, which were kept in the Berlin Museum. So in 1924, Emil Forer surprised the world by his announcement that he had found, quote, of course in German, but I say it in English, pre-Homeric Greeks in the Boasque text. According to him, the term land of Achiyava, and this is a name I will use all the evening, Achiyava or Achiyava or Achiyava, which occurs in several Hittite texts, meant the Achaeans, and that means, of course, the Greeks. This claim was soon challenged by other Hittitologists, such as Johannes Friedrich in 1927 and Albrecht Götze in 1930, both scholars who belonged to the pioneers of deciphering and making available the Hittite language. Then in 1932, Ferdinand Sommer, the great man of German Indo-European studies at the time, in Munich, published a monumental book, the Achiava Urkunden, the Achiava documents, <coughs> in which he presented a reinterpretation of all the sources with detailed philological commentary. He came to the conclusion that none of the points that Forer had advanced could be really proven. And therefore, since there was no proof, he rejected the whole idea. This total rejection was seen by others as going too far. Already in 1935, Fritz Schachermeyer countered with the monograph Hethita und Acher, in which he concluded that the assumption that the name Achriava referred to Greeks was highly probable, even though it could not be strictly proven. Recently, the same author, also I think approaching 90, uh, came out in a new book even more strongly for the same idea. The most outspoken advocate of the Greek theory was G. L. Huxley in the monograph Achaeans and Hittites published in 1960, while on the other hand, many German scholars still are very skeptical, and one of them by the name of Steiner uh, published an article in 1964 in which he again disproved, as he thought, every single detail of the whole argument. Now, by this, one gen more than a generation old uh, dispute, I must say it is still a matter of faith. The Achiava question has remained a matter of faith. There are believers and skeptics. On the one hand, the skeptics have one point by saying that in, on strictly uh, linguistic terms, Achiava, or the older form on a, without the final WA, Achia, are not correct renderings of either Achaiwoi or Achaivia or Achaiva or whatever Greek form you reconstruct for either the country or the people. But I belong to those who think that strict phonetic laws cannot be applied to the rendering of foreign names. I think that if other considerations favor the equation, the lack of correct phonetic correspondence is not a serious obstacle. And I'm saying that about this case where the Hittites would have rendered a foreign name, namely Akaioi. Uh, later in this evening, we'll talk about something that went the other way around, and there it's not that simple. Since the days of Forer's announcement and of uh, Sommer's rejection of it, 
the picture of the ancient Near East has changed, the ancient world, I mean, has changed. Thanks to Michael Ventris's decipherment uh, of Linear B, we know that the bearers of the Mycenaean civilization were indeed Greeks. And uh, the number of West Anatolian uh, sites, uh, I use the term Anatolia for what politically now is, country, is uh, the country of Turkey. Uh, so in West Anatolian sites, the, the number of places that have uh, Mycenaean finds has increased very much during the last decade. And common sense would tell us that the Greek world was no more remote from Anatolia than Babylon or Egypt, so that it is hard to understand why the Hittites should not have known and mentioned them, mentioned the Greek world. At this point, I would like to have some slides. <coughs> the first one is a map that uh, some years ago Professor Bittle published of Mycenaean finds in the west of Anatolia. And down here you have the settlement find burial. I want to pull, uh, bring to your attention particularly the two little crosses that mark Hittite monuments, namely here at the Karabel and secondly at Mount Sipilus near Magnesia, which is still Manisa. And here are these two monuments. This is the colossal figure. I took this shot while there were some tourists, and you see the scale. These are persons, and this is that figure very rough, uh, badly weathered, but apparently a seated goddess. That's on Mount Sipilus. The other is this mountain pass, the Carabel, where uh, this Hittite relief is carved in this beautiful natural uh, rock surface, and a close-up of the relief is like this. It is a Hittite god. It is in the Hittite style, but both the other one and this one have hieroglyphic inscriptions, which do not belong to a Hittite great king. In the case of uh, Lady on Sipilus, it's probably a Hittite prince, but here it is apparently a local ruler. So in a sense, they are Hittite work, works of art, but they are not directly uh, inspired or made on behalf of the central administration, even though they are certainly inspired by the, uh, by the style. I now show you what is perhaps the most beautiful Hittite relief in existence, which is at the Hittite capital, uh, showing a god who puts his protecting arm around the neck of a king. The reason why I show, show it here is in particular this headdress of the god, which is a high conical uh, structure with many pairs of horns the horns being the sign of divinity. And why do I show it? Because at Miletus, which is one of the classical sites on the west coast of Turkey, uh, there has been excavated a Mycenaean uh, settlement, and we'll talk about it later. And in it was found this fragment of a crater of definitely Mycenaean style, but local manufacture. And on it, there is painted exactly one of these Hittite uh, divine headdresses. Presumably, uh, when the thing was complete, there was a figure of a god shown. So some people who live in the Mycenaean part of Miletus and produce typical Mycenaean pottery knew enough of the Hittites to be able to paint such a god. At the other end of the spectrum, there is a, unfortunately, the whole thing is available in this rather thin drawing. I hope you can see it. These are, is a incised drawing on the inside of a Hittite bowl, and this time the pottery is typically Hittite, found in Boasque, belonging to around 1400 BC. On the fragment, you have the upper part of a warrior or god. No, where, where is my, here. Uh, and down here are 
probably his feet, and then there are the feet of what probably is a, a, a Syrian enemy. But anyway, the point is that the headdress, the helmet that he is wearing, looks very much Aegean, uh, so that the, apparently the Hittite draftsman who do, did this knew something about the Greek world at the other end of the country. And then there is this cylinder seal, which was, which is definitely Hittite in style and has Hittite hieroglyphs. Uh, here, the name of the uh, seal owner, uh, who is at the same time worshiping the deities, and then there are other symbols, and uh, the name of, where is it? The name of a, of a deity is written here in hieroglyphs. So, this was found in a house in Thebes in Greece. It was part of a big hoard of lapis lazuli, and the theory that was brought out by Professor Edith Porada, who published this hoard, is that it all came from the king of Assyria, who had kind of collected lapis and then sent it as a bribe or as a gift to his ally in Greece. But whatever the story, it is a Hittite thing, it is Near Eastern, the others are also Near Eastern, the others are uh, Babylonian and older, and this and that and the other, and Mitanni, what have you. But there was a shipment from the Near East into Greece at this time, at about 1200 BC. So there was no, none of this isolation that some people would see between the West and the East. So, there was found a text, and that was also one little fragment that, as Professor Hemp mentioned, was found during my participation in the excavation and published by myself, which is an inventory where an object, the nature of which we don't know, but made of copper with the provenience of Achiava is listed in a Hittite inventory, as probably kept in the treasury or so. And uh, individual uh, Mycenaean pots, which of course in this case do not mean settlements but may have come as tribute or as gift, were found way inside Anatolia to remind you the Hittite capital. Where is my? Yeah. The Hittite capital is here. The two places where such pots were found was one Mashat over here to the northeast of Boatskö, and the other one Fraktin down in, on the road that goes into Cilicia, and where there is a Hittite <coughs> royal relief also. So there was contact. They got something from the West uh, somehow. Now, so much for the common sense. What about uh, detailed problems? One of the most important is, of course, where was Achiava situated? In Anatolia or outside? The skeptics, no, let me say the other way around, the believers have always quoted passages in which Achiava is apparently reached by a ship. So they said, aha, overseas. Maybe Greece, at least the island, maybe Crete, maybe Rhodes, but outside Anatolia. The skeptics said, no so. Why shouldn't they have uh, done uh, coastal, uh, coastal navigation? They can go from one country in Anatolia to the other. In, now, unfortunately, this map doesn't show the west coast, but if you know how the west coast is, it's much shorter on land than anywhere to go by boat from one harbor on the west coast to the other. Uh, so this was one thing. Uh, then the skeptics said, well, forget about this uh, phonetic similarity, which is maybe completely misleading. <coughs> Try to find Achiava in, uh, on the map in Turkey itself and see how it relates to other countries. Now, this is about the most difficult problem uh, other people have already published the statement that Hittite geography <coughs> is a mess. Yeah, this is a, this is a country where you, a, a map where you can see how this looks. Now you go from here to here all the way around, 
It's very likely. Anyway, uh, people have tried to locate Achiava by relating it to other countries. And they mentioned in the text where perhaps you get a fixed point somewhere and then you have to say, well, this relates to X relates to Y and Y relates to Z and Z relates to Achiava, therefore Achiava must be such and such. The, the attempts go, they included at one point Cilicia, but that was given up, but they still go from Pamphylia all the way around, any places here in the West, and as far up as what we call the Troad. Let me show it on the map right now because we are going to talk about it many times. Troy is shown here. This whole, what you may call peninsula, it's not really one, between the Sea of Marmara, the strait, and this gulf down here. This area is known as the Troad, meaning the country of Troy. Uh, those theories about placing Achiava didn't stop there. They went across the strait, and one scholar even wanted to put uh, Achiava into Thrace. While we have the map, I want to show you one or two other things. Miletus, which will play quite a role, is down here on the, uh, on the shore at the place where the river Meander reaches the sea. And uh, another one, which is not that important, but uh, occurs, is uh, Ephesus, which is the, in the form of Apasa uh, mentioned and is the capital of the country of Arzava. I will also talk about the term Asia as it first appears, which we know is somewhere in the West and before it became a name for the whole co uh, continent. And most people think that original Asia is where the historical kingdom of Lydia was situated. So, so somewhere in this whole area. Uh, Excuse me. So people have tried to place it all these, in all these places. Now, let's look at the evidence for putting Achiava into Anatolia. One such uh, text, uh, text source is an, the so-called indictment of Maduvatas, the indictment of a local ruler by the name of Maduvatas, which uh, is connected with the names of two Hittite kings. And I gave you this, uh, I put this for a while on the screen uh, to show you that there are so many repetitions. There is the combination Tuthalias, Anuvandas, Tuthalias here, there is Tuthalias and Anuvandas again there. And for a long time, texts that were connected with these names were believed to belong to these late kings. They are just uh, one or two generations before the end at 1200. And on the other hand, we now, on linguistic grounds, uh, grammatical and uh, others, spelling and uh, use of words and what have you, have very good reasons, and I belong to the people who think that this is correct, to redate these texts to these gentlemen, to this Tuthalia and this Anuvandas. And with Stupiduliumas fixed by his contemporaneity with Akhnaten, you get into around 1400, maybe a little before 1400, end of 15th century for this. So at this time, there was this man, uh, Maduvatas, who very badly misbehaved by uh, being, although he was a Hittite vessel, he always turned against the Hittites in the end. Uh, sometimes the Hittites had to rescue him from the attacks of a man who is called Attarissias, Attarissias, the man of Achia. And this is the earliest mentioning, and this is where the short form is used. Now, who is Attarissias of Achia? Uh, Fora thought he was Atreus, but this doesn't work either chronologically nor phonetically nor in any way. But it sounds as if the name could be something that 
where the Greek name is underlying. Uh, where do they operate? They operate, let me try the back thing. Yeah, they operate down, there is a city not shown on the map, known as the classical Klos, and in the local language, Klava, and some of these uh, deeds, these uh, military encounters, happen to be in the neighborhood of Klos. Now, does it mean that this man, who commands a modest 100 uh, chariots, is the king of Achia, and therefore Achia is located in Anatolia, or couldn't it be something else? In time, it is far remote from all the things that we hear from later periods, and to my mind, uh, Atarisias of Achia could very easily be just one of the Achaeans who by that time had already settled on the Anatolian coast, and who went adventuring and building up as a condottiere his own little realm. One thing he did, together with Maduvatas, was a raid on Cyprus. And that, of course, also has puzzled people very much. How come, and there is nothing Hittite in Cyprus, well, but the raids don't change the pottery of a country, I think. So, uh, that much for this oldest. Then there was another text that belongs to the later period, to this other Tudhalia in the... Oh, wait a minute. Are you still going? Oh, I, I gave the wrong key, so here they are. Operator, can you get the kings once more, the king list, the last slide? Thank you. Uh, what I'm seeing is there is a text that belongs most probably down here, to Hatushili the third, in which there is a phrase that was translated both by Fora and again by Sommer as the king of Achia was retreated. So if he retreated, he must have been there with his troops. If he was in Anatolia with his troops, he probably had his country in Anatolia. Now, the verb retreated doesn't mean retreated, and this was one of the things that I uh, kind of found out when I re-studied those texts that Sommer had done so carefully. It much rather means to take refuge with, or maybe even to put one's trust into when it's a person, and so, or rely on. So I translate, uh, Mr. So-and-so attacked us and relied on the king of Achiava. And you can rely on somebody who is very far away. So that doesn't prove anything. Now, uh, I, other passages are less clear and less uh, usable for proving anything. I may state, as I said also in print, we didn't find, or I didn't find, any co convincing, cogent proof for a situation of uh, Achiava either in Anatolia or outside, except for something to which I shall come a little later in the course of our discussion. There is one very important document, uh, which is a long letter, or rather only the third tablet of a very long letter, written by the Hittite king to the king of Achiava. The text is in Hittite, and of course, we have asked ourselves, how was that transmitted? Did the people in, if, if Achiava is Greek, uh, Greece, uh, did the people over there uh, know Hittite, or did they know Akkadian? Did it have to be translated into Akkadian, or did the Hittites have people who translated it into Mycenaean Greek, into Linear B, as it were? Uh, we don't know that. But here is the draft, and it is in the Hittite archive, and it is written in Hittite. And it is definitely addressed to the king of Achiava by the king of the Hittites, 
since the name must have been at the very beginning in the first tablet and we don't have it, in this third tablet the names are never revealed. So we don't know to which king it really belongs. But the best candidates are these two, Hattushili and his older brother Muvatali. Muvatali, by the way, is the king who fought the battle of Kadesh and that is linked to the accession year of uh, Ramses II, and this is why I put a definite date here. For the others, you always have to guess. So the text belongs either to him or to him, uh, with a twice plus for him, for Hattushili. And it deals in the beginning with a person by the strange name Tavakalavas, which certainly doesn't sound Hittite, has been claimed from the beginning by Fora, and that was even accepted by Sommer, as possibly Greek. And the Greek form that has been adduced is, you know, with the still preserved Ws, which in classical Greek were already dropped. Uh, many of you, of you are familiar with this, I'm sure. So reconstructed at the Etevokleves, Tavaklavas, Tavakalavas, and that would be what in our pronunciation Latinized, Anglicized is Eteocles. So that would be a good Greek name. And the text says that he is the brother of the king of Achiava. Now this was denied by Sommer, and again, by looking at the text again, I was able to dispel his objections on the basis, and I have, must confess that, on the basis of texts that were published after Sommer's time. So he couldn't know, know it at the time. He had certain reservations which were legitimate at the time, but now we have material that uh, disproves his objection. So he is the brother. And the interesting uh, thing is that just a minute. The Kedite king speaks of the charioteer, who actually is a relative of the queen, so a very high general or something like that, of whom he says has, he has been stepping on the chariot with me, that is the writer, the Hittite king, since my youth, and also with your brother Tavakalavas. <laughs> so there it says that Tavakalavas was your brother, meaning the addressee, meaning the king of Achiava. The main subject of this uh, uh, tablet, however, is the misdeeds again of a certain Piamaradus, who has a beautiful name that you may call Hittite in the wider sense, but actually belongs to the Luvian language about which you heard from Professor Hemp and about which I will also talk later in this uh, talk. So it's a Luvian name but belongs to the Hittite uh, cultural sphere. And he is operating against the Hittites. He is constantly making raids and apparently with the connivance or some favor that he gets from the king of Achiava. So the Hittite king uh, urges the uh, king of Achiava uh, to stop this and to tell this man he should finally stop, and he actually wants him extradited. And he goes, he, the Hittite king, goes to the city of Milavata, or there it spells Milavanda, to receive this man, because there is a man who apparently is in the service of the king of Achiava, who will be the person, the middleman, who hands over this uh, sort individual. And he also says, the Hittite king also says, I'm going there so that my brother's subjects may hear what I have to say to Piamaradus. So my brother, my brother is the address to a, a king of equal rank. Uh, my brother's subjects means subjects of the king of Achiava, and they are in the city of Milavanda. When he gets there, Piamaradus has gone by boat. 
So from this we, we learn that Milavata is by the sea. From the fact that it has a Chiyavan uh, subjects, we suspect it to be a My Mycenaean settlement or something. And there is Miletus, which has practically the same name, with the old form Milatus or Milatos. Uh, so I do, like many others, believe that actually Milavata is Milatos. Again, there are people who say, no, it has to be something else, and the phonetics are not exact, and where does the W come from, and uh, object to it in all kinds of ways, but I still think common sense says that uh, Milavata is Milatos. So uh, that is the main gist of this, but there is one more, and this is where we get a short link even with our Trojan complex, and that is that somewhere in the text, in this letter, the Hittite king says, yes, it is true. You and I, we once quarreled, or maybe made war, or were hostile to each other, on account of the city of Vilusas. And that Vilusas is a candidate, perhaps, for Troy, as we shall discuss. That would mean that at one time, whatever it was, whether they actually came to uh, actual war or whether they only had diplomatic uh, objections and protests, but they were bickering about Vilusas, the Hittites on the one hand and the Archeans on the, the presumed Archeans on the other side. And of course you can imagine how that would beautifully fit. There are people who think that the Amazons, who are mentioned by Homer as one of the allies of the Trojans, actually represent the Hittites. So there you have a beautiful picture, the Hittites fighting the Greeks on account of Troy. But all this in question marks and with 20 uh, question marks, of course, uh, quotation marks and question marks. So that is uh, this now the most important passage in the, for my argumentation, in this Tavagalava's letter <coughs> is the following. On the whole, this letter is in a very restrained, polite tone. He kind of excuses himself that he goes into Milavata just to get this uh, man expedited and to tell people, the local people, what he thinks about him. He, in another passage, apologizes for the case that really a few words ascribed to him had been of an offense. that mention Achiava are perfectly reconcilable with this idea. They are, they, none of them is a proof, but they all fit. That's my point. Now, this much about Achiava, what about Troy? Well, I already mentioned the article. Uh, there is a Hittite text, and this was what I had to contribute to the symposium in Brimont. There is a Hittite text that is a treaty between King Muvatalis and a man who is, no, is called Alexandus of the city and country of Vilusas. Already in the same year, 1924, another scholar by the name of Paul Kretschmer compared this to the Greek name Alexandros, which is the other name of Paris, at Ilios, which again with the reconstructed W probably originally was a Vilios. He then went on uh, in the historical introduction to the treaty, the predecessor is mentioned of uh, Alexandus. His name is Kukunis. This could be a very good Anatolian name. There are some, many names that sound like this Pupuli. Uh, Pupuli, Zuzuli, and what have you. But it does a little bit look like the Greek word kuknos, or kuknos, which means swan, the bird, swan. And there is a hero by that name, kuknos, mentioned not in Homer, but in other Greek tradition, actually two different 
Kyknosis, and both of them are somehow connected with Troy. So Kretschmer noted that. Then other people uh, remi uh, were reminded of a passage in the 6th century uh, lexicographer Stephanus Byzantius, so a Byzantine writer, who in his list of cities mentioned that a certain Motilus, or Motilos, who was the founder of a town in Caria, on the west coast, that is, was host to Paris and Helen, supposedly during their uh, boat trip from Sparta to Troy. So Motulos reminded people of Muvatalis, and Paris, of course, is Alexandros, so there you got one more. Then the tablet, the treaty tablet, like so many treaty tablets, lists the gods who are invoked as witnesses and guardians of the uh, treaty, divided between the gods of Hitt the Hittites, a long list, and the gods of Vilusas. And there is only a handful of those. Uh, the word sign for the storm god, which could be any, any storm god, then a gap, and then beginning just at the break where the gap is uh, ended, Apalyunas. And then there come just the rivers and uh, the rivers and mountains and things like that, which also, of course, are divine beings. So immediately grab this Apalyunas and that this is Apollo. And that would be very nice. Phonetically, it works. There, uh, there is from uh, one early form, Apellon, uh, reconstructed something that might have been Apellion. And so from Apellion to Apalyunas, we already in Tavagalavas, I didn't uh, mention it, but uh, there is a kind of a pattern that uh, Greek epsilon appears as A in the rendering in I did mention Apasa for Ephesus. So Apellion for, uh, and Apalyunas would go very nicely together. And in the mythology, for one thing in Homer, Apollo definitely is on the side of the Trojans. You remember that the gods are divided between friends of the Greeks and friends of the, of the Trojans. So uh, Apollo is on the Trojan side. Secondly, the name Apollo is very strange, has not been uh, explained from Greek, and people have always played with a foreign uh, origin of it. I'm not, say that, not saying that uh, this Apollyunash is the source for the not so Greek Apollo, but it is one of the things that could be possible. So this is quite a list, and the, my next uh, task now was, in my paper at, at uh, Bryn Mawr, to uh, analyze the various uh, items in that list. And there I must say, you will see that there are doubts. The strongest of these uh, equations is Alex, Alexandus equal Alexandros. For one thing, Alexandus is not like any other Anatolian name. Therefore, it is likely to be foreign. The similarity with Alexandros is close, especially because of this R and Epsilon business. And there was one thing br brought up by Sommer that names containing the word for man as one element of the compound, like Alexandros would be, in the older period, we are not formed with Andros, but with Enor. So you would expect an Alexenor. Well, this went down the drain with uh, Michael Ventris and the linear B, because in the city of Mycenae itself, in a list of very modest, just women, women workers or whatever they are, but there is a lady whose name is spelled in this funny spelling that has no, no L, but only has to repl uh, replace every L by an R. 
a re ka sa da ra. And that immediately has been read, phonetically interpreted as Alexandra. So if you have an Alexandra with Andra, you can also have a male Ale Alexandros with Andros. And so this is the best. And I would then say that the, this vessel, uh, who, this man who became a vessel of the Hittites in Vilusas, really seems to have had a Greek name, whatever, however you explain it. The Kunkunis, as I said, is very likely to be a real Anatolian name, but still, the Greeks might have heard it, might have likened it to their word for the swan, and therefore managed to have a hero swan who went to Troy. Motilus, of course, as the ruler of, a, of maybe of the whole carrier even, but even so, a relatively small area near the sea, is a far cry from the uh, uh, great King Muvatalis of the Hittites, and at the same time, uh, the relationship is not that of a, of a suzerain and a vassal, it's a relationship of a host to a guest. And in the case of Apalyunas, I already, yeah, there is a great problem. It's broken at the beginning. I said it begins just after the break. And there is a tiny little trace and the trace could be the remnants of several cuneiform signs. One of them is A, one of them is Za, and one of them is Kar. So Zoma said, why Apalyunas? It could be Zapalyunas, it could even be Kar Apalyunas, which then could be read either Krapalyunas or Karpalyunas. Those people who choose Apalyunas are, of course, prejudiced. This is, uh, you know, preconceived idea. Well, my answer to that is that does not make it impossible. It's still possible, and in the light of everything else, I feel justified in using this preconceived idea and choose Apalyunas. Otherwise, I already said what the relationship might be. Now, the weakest point really is the equation of Vilusas with Ilios or Vilios on several grounds. For one thing, there is a, another city, Vilusias, which could be the same because such additional endings in uh, place names do occur. But on the other hand, what we hear about Vilusias is quite different from what we hear about Vilusas. This older Sutralias, whom we still have here on the screen, this one, says that he had to fight a large uh, coalition of about 20 odd uh, states or cities or countries, which all together formed the, or well, went under the leadership of a country called Asuvas, and this Asuvas was compared with uh, Asia. This is why I showed you where Asia would be on the map. Then it was pres presumed that that list was geographic, which is possible but by no means necessary, and that it went from south to north, which again is possible but not necessary, and Vilu Vilusias and Taruisas. Two countries are at the end of that list. And those were then compared with Vilios and Troy. Taruisas, you can read Truisas, and you get very close. But for one thing, he, the, this Atutralia says that he defeated the whole coalition and sacked every single of the member countries, deported their inhabitants. Muvatalis, in his treaty, in the historical introduction to the treaty, speaks of Tutralias and said, at that time, Vilusas was at peace, so he didn't attack it. So there you have a 
contradiction between what we hear about Vilusas and Vilusia. Secondly, in both these names, Vilusas and Vilusias and Truisas, we don't know what to, what to do with the S's. There are cases in Greek where an old S between vowels is dropped, but it should leave a it should leave a kind of a trace. And I had a long conversation with Eric Hemp about particularly about the use. How come that there is a V Lu sus? Even if you drop the S, you still have a V Lu as and not a V Li os. So there is this difficulty, there is a historical difficulty. Then the question is again where is Vilusas is situated. And again, by comparing it or the, by studying its relation to other countries, people have played around on the map. Can we have the map once more? The, the one was last. Yeah. Uh, so, where exactly is Vilusas? Any, anything around here? It's probably in, it's probably part of the Azava countries, which means in the west. And uh, if the king of Achiava had reason to challenge the Hittites about it, we would expect it to be by the sea. So then finally people said, oh, it, it best fits into the Troad. But of course, it fits into the Troad already because they think of Troy and Vilios. So this is a fishy thing. Now, uh, all this, of course, does not prove the historicity of the Trojan War, and it doesn't even prove that Vilusas is really Ilios. Now, of course, you have read the article which says that Professor Watkins found a little verse, and uh, that will prove the historicity, or will help proving the historicity of the war. And for that, I venture to summarize a little bit what Watkins said and interpreting it, I hope, in his sense. Uh, but of course, the credit of what I'm now going to say belongs to uh, Calvin Watkins of Harvard, who was one of the speakers at our symposium. He had been asked to talk about the language or languages of Troy. So he started out by saying, of course, I really shouldn't stand here because we know nothing. There is no writing there, so how do we know? And then he started giving indications, reasons for certain uh, theories, uh, hypotheses that one could build. One was that well, because it is one of the Arzava countries, and because we know that in the Arzava countries there was Luvian, that the language might have been Luvian. Secondly, he quoted Professor Laroche of Paris, who had etymologized the name of Priam, Priamos, as a Luvian Piaramuva. P, P, yeah. Pariamuva, Pariamuva, excuse me. Pariamuva, which is fine, possible, but of course not provable. Then he found, he talked about a certain Luvian verse. The Luvian language we know almost exclusively in this period and written in cuneiform, I mean, cuneiform Luvian as it's called, we almost exclusively know from quotation in Hittite text. Religious texts where either the exorcist or the priest pronounces something in Luvian. And in one of these texts, there is uh, Watkins recognized that this was not magic stuff, that this must be something poetic, perhaps, or hymns or uh, beginnings, first lines of songs. And one of these is, can be read and can be analyzed and has the beautiful form, oh, on what page is it here? Uh, 
Ahatata alati uventi aventi vilusati. Ahatata alati aventi vilusati. The forms in ati are ablatives. This last word vilusati could be the name of the city of Vilusa. The form aventi is known, means they came. The achatata is when they, however when they. And the alati obviously must be an adjective in agreement with the noun, and he found places that indicate that it means something like hi. And with this he compared a set formula in Homer, where Ilios is called Ipene. Ilios Ipene. And Ipenos is uh, def defined in my old dictionary simply as hi, but in uh, Little Scott it says hi and steep, and <laughs> Professor Watkins preferred the translation steep. But for me it just makes no difference. I, I would prefer still to say. So it is high Ilios and it is high Vilosa. Now this again doesn't prove that Ilios is Vilosas, but it gives one more little indication it, uh, added to the Alexandros and the Kyknos and the, and the Apollon, what have you, that there is some relation between the two cities. The other thing is that these set phrases do, of course, belong to what is now always defined as the formula. Maybe we can have the lights now. I don't think I need these slides anymore. Uh, the so-called formula. The idea is that during the period of oral transmission, the bards used set phrases to help their memory, and that is the so-called formulaic uh, form of uh, epic. And you have a set formula, Ilios uh, Ipene, and here you have now verbatim the uh, Ali uh, Vilusas in a Luvian verse. That this is a verse, it's obvious, it splits into two halves with the caesura and even with an internal rhyme. Now, Many scholars on the Greek side had already said that in Homer there are a few archaisms, forms that are not really according to the rules of classical Greek or even Homeric Greek, which must go back to something much older. Therefore, some of the formulae apparently were composed centuries before Homer. The traditional day for Homer himself is eight centuries, so you get up to the ninth, tenth, and you pretty soon come to our twelfth and thirteenth centuries. So the fact now that what looks like a Homeric formula, a Homeric set phrase, seems to have a close parallel in Luvian would of course be a nice indication that those people who want to update the whole oral tradition would be on the right track. And finally, and here I may now, and now this is really the gist of Professor Watkins' thing. Uh, he never said that this uh, little verse confirms the war. He only gave all these indications of close relationship. For me, this means one step further. The same Emil Forer, who started that whole business with Achiawa, some years later, in 1936, made public a text, a Hittite text, that probably goes back to a Hurrian original. Hurrian is a language spoken way in the east, in northern Mesopotamia and northern Syria in the second millennium. So a Hittite text that goes back to the Hurrians which speaks of the generations of gods, of the kingship in heaven. Three or four gods, one after the other, each one taking away the kingship of his predecessor. In one case, even by castrating him. And this he immediately compared to Hesiod, 
theogony. Now, in ours, there are, I have later retranslated his text, and I reconstructed another epic that deals with a, the attempt of the latest of these gods to regain the uh, kingship. So, to give you the names, it is Alalu, Anu, and Anu means sky, a Babylonian taking over by the Koreans, uh, Kumarbi, and the storm god Teshub. Alalu, Anu, Kumarbi, Teshub. This begins one generation earlier than the Greek, so that begins with Uranos, the sky, and then comes Kronos and Zeus. And the story of the monster by which Kronos or Kumarbi tries to get the kingship back from Teshub or Zeus uh, is the uh, story of the monster Typhon or Typhoeus in uh, Hesiod, which is also part of the theogony of the same, uh, the same poem. Now, at the time when I worked on these, of course, I thought, I asked myself, how did they get to the Greeks? And at that time, I thought, these contacts with Achiava, this is all much too vague, and this is highly literary, and it's much more likely that they got it later. We have indications that the same myth was also at home in uh, Phoenicia. Uh, there is... Uh, preserved in fragments the writings of a certain uh, Phylon of Byblos who lived around or wrote around 100 AD and writes about these things as a so-called Phoenician history and he has even the same four generations. Again with Uranus uh, as one of them. And so I thought maybe the Greeks got it in the 8th and 9th centuries directly from the Phoenicians. Now, with this little formula in Luvian being possibly contemporary with very early pre-Homeric oral poetry, the thing changes very much. And I would be now inclined to think that, let me call it my, Kumarbi Ulikumi also was taken over in this old time. And I have taken much too much time of your uh, relied on your patience for much too long a time. Thank you very much and excuse me.